once again everyone and welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you are new here so you may have noticed i didn't get to upload a video on monday like i had wanted to because somebody we know aka the new puppy decided that she would like to eat my macbook charger so i had to order a new one and wait for it to come in the mail because my laptop was pretty much dead it didn't have enough to look stuff up and edit a video and do all that kind of stuff that it needs to do so i decided it'd just be better to wait than try to rush and hurry and get things done while my battery was still alive you know so that's why there wasn't a video on monday i don't know if y'all were wondering about that if you even cared i don't know but that's the little explanation there so as you can see it's another true crime video I promise this is not all my channel's gonna be. I'm gonna make other videos, but right now, this is really what I'm into. I really wanna pursue this series. I feel like I've, I've gotten really good responses from you guys. You guys seem to enjoy it. So I'm gonna keep doing it. I can do some tattoo related content. I know some people asked about that in the comments. So if there's anything in particular y'all would like me to talk about, just let me know shoot me a comment down below i would love to make a video that you guys want to see if you want to see some tattoo stuff anything else just let me know you guys know i'm kind of a jack of all trades when it comes to videos i do a little bit of everything just to keep it you know keep the variety going it's always a good idea um oh and i was thinking about making a video about like tattoo history like um vintage tattooed women like older pictures of women with tattoos back in like the 40s and the 60s and stuff so if you guys want like a video about that type of thing i think that'd be really cool i've really wanted to look into that so let me know what you guys think but without further ado this intro is really long it's two minutes what the heck hannah so anyway let's just jump into this story um missing persons case i guess would be a better word for it and it is the case of Stephen Kocher. Now, I'm going to have to look at my computer a lot during this because there are very, very specific details that my brain does not remember. My brain doesn't remember times, dates, that kind of thing. So, you see me looking down. That's why I want to get the information right. Hopefully, oh crap. <laughs> Hopefully, we can actually make a difference here on the channel. Maybe bring somebody home. I don't know. I have big ambitions. I want to help people. So anyway, this is the missing persons case of Stephen Kocher and he was 30 years old when he disappeared in 2009 and he actually disappeared on December 13th of 2009. So Stephen had an apartment in St. George, Utah and he was described by his family as being really fun and like he loved the outdoors, he loved water sports, and he was also a devout Mormon. He was very, very involved with his church, and he was just all around like a really good guy, it seemed like to me. And you know, he had a lot of good things going for him, but despite, you know, having this great personality and these cool interests and, you know, being involved with the church, he had some issues. He had some debts. He was having trouble finding steady work. He would get an odd job here and there, but he was really having trouble finding a career path, like something that he could do for a while. And his family said that he seemed kind of unhappy and maybe a little bit depressed around the time of his disappearance, but they would like to stress that he did not seem like someone who would ever hurt themselves or commit suicide or do anything like that. It didn't seem like he would run away from his life or his family. He was acting pretty normal as far as he went. He was kind of an odd guy, but you know, that's just the way that he was. His family knew he had these debts. He had a few issues that we'll get into. So, you know, but they, they did not think that he was someone who would be a risk that would kill themselves or hurt themselves or run away or pack up and move somewhere. They just didn't think that that would be typical for him. So the timeline of everything that happened is very specific and very confusing and I want to make sure that I get it exactly right because things are confusing and they seem like they're not right, but they are. And so that's, that's my issue. Like I look at this and I read it 
and my brain thinks it's something else. So I have, I don't have it exactly from the timeline. I do have some timelines linked down below so you guys can get more information. Obviously, I cannot read every single thing to you about what happened right before his disappearance and during and all of that, but there's a lot more information down in the description as usual. Um, I encourage you guys to go and read for yourselves because there's a lot to this case and it, there's a lot of information but there's not a lot of evidence and that's the frustrating part. So anyway, um, here's what happened. So we're just going to go through the entire month of December because that's when all of this took place leading up to. So the first week of December, Stephen's landlord actually contacted his parents which sounds so weird to me because as a 30 year old why would your landlord contact your parents i know that when you move in somewhere you sign a lease you can have a co-signer but i didn't hear anything about them co-signing for the apartment or a reason why the landlord would be able to get in contact with them unless they were listed as like an emergency contact or something like that but throughout this whole case the way that the landlord is described it sounds to me like the landlord and Steven were kind of friends, like they were buddies, because the landlord contacted Steven's parents about the rent. He was three months behind on rent, and Steven's mother and father said that the landlord was working with Steven so that he could keep the apartment. He was like paying little bits here and there to keep the utilities on and stuff like that. But as far as rent was concerned, he was three months behind, which is pretty significant. Uh, if you're the landlord, you know, you want your money. So then on December 7th, Stephen attended a church Christmas dinner, but he didn't stay long. And his mother said that he left abruptly and um, it was just kind of strange that he left so quickly. And then the very next day on the 8th, Stephen did a little odd job. He worked as a window washer and he actually saw his boss that day. I guess it was like, I guess it's like this one guy who runs a window washing service and he just hires random people who need the little job or whatever. So that's what Stephen was doing that day. And he saw his boss and his boss's name is Travis Hansen. And Hansen is described as giving Stephen $100. Now, I think the way that they worded this is weird, and I don't know if it's just miswording on their part, if they meant that he gave him the $100 because he worked that day, but to me it sounds like he gave Stephen $100 just for no reason, no explained reason, he just gave Stephen $100, which seems odd to me, and I don't, there's no explanation behind it, there's no, nobody said anything about it. So I don't, I don't know if that's just um, they worded it strangely or if there's something weird going on there. And you'll see why I mentioned that in a second. So this whole first week of December, he's acting pretty normal. A few weird things here and there, but nothing crazy. And he's talking to his friends, his family, just like he normally would. He answers the phone when they call. He you know, he doesn't miss a ton of calls. He's just a normal dude. And he's talking to them as normal, using Facebook, all this stuff. No mention of travel plans. No mention of going anywhere on a trip. No mention of driving out of the state. Just nothing. He didn't say anything out of the ordinary to them. So on December 9th of 2009, Stephen attends the Ward Temple Night, which is like the evening church service, I believe. And it was from 5.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. He was seen by a lot of people. Everybody remembers seeing him there. Apparently, they were doing, like, activities during the service. And everybody recalled seeing him during it. And um, at 9.47, so after the church service, Stephen is at Walmart, we believe. It was a grocery store, but everybody seems to think it was Walmart. Not that it really matters. And he got a phone call from his father. And the father was calling about the father was calling about Stephen's landlord and how he was three months back on rent, and um, he was just like, "Hey, what are we gonna do about this?" And apparently, Stephen's mother said that Stephen and his father 
were working on getting a plan together so that he could pay off his debts and he wouldn't be in all this debt and he wouldn't be stressed out so often. So they were really trying to work on a plan, but apparently in this phone call, Stephen's father said something that offended Stephen or made him upset or whatever, and he hung up the phone on him. So remember, Stephen's at Walmart at almost 10 o'clock at night, and he goes home, his neighbors saw him come home, he went in, he put up his groceries or whatever, but nobody was like up to see him leave. He went on a trip, Either he left either late December 9th or early December 10th, and he departed for Ruby Valley, Nevada. And it's been calculated that the latest time he could have left to be in Ruby Valley by 11 a.m. is 1.15 a.m. on the 10th. And we know that he was there at 11 um, for reasons I will tell you in a moment. But anyway, at 5.45, he arrived at Maverick Gas slash C store in Salt Lake City, Utah, purchased gas. Friends tried to contact him during this time and he did not pick up the phone, which to me, either he's a really safe driver or he's hiding something. And I'm kind of leaning toward he's hiding something because he answered the phone for his mom while he was driving later on. But anyway, at 8.45, Stephen arrived at a pilot travel center in West Wendover, Nevada. And at 11 a.m., which is when we know that he was there, he arrived at, get this, his ex-girlfriend's parents' house. That's a little bit strange. I don't know about you, but I don't just casually go to my ex's parents' house. Especially when the ex isn't there. I don't know if he planned for her not to be there, but when he got there, his ex-girlfriend was not at her parents' house. So, what does he do? He stays for lunch. So, he stayed from 11, p or 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. That's uh, how long he was in Ruby Valley. And... Like I said, he stayed for lunch. He said that he was stopping there because he was on the way to Sacramento, California, I presume. I think that's the only Sacramento I know. Um, said he was on his way to Sacramento to visit his family, which was a lie. That was not true. He had no intention of going to Sacramento. So I don't know if he was going to try to get his girlfriend back. I don't know if he was just going to be weird. I have no idea why he went. Nobody knows why he went because he was not on his way to Sacramento at all. So like I said, nobody knows the reason why he went all the way to Ruby Valley. Uh, I guess it has something to do with the girlfriend. I don't know. But in total, the round trip took 17 hours for him to drive with all of his stops. And he drove approximately 1,091 miles there and back round trip. So that is a long, long way to drive for no reason. And he didn't tell his parents about this. He didn't tell his family, his friends. Nobody knew about this until after he went missing because of like the security cameras at the gas stations and stuff. Like that is so bizarre to me. Why would you do that and not tell anybody? His mom called him when he was on the way home and he didn't mention anything. She said he didn't say anything out of the ordinary. And that's just so strange to me. I don't understand at all what that was about. There's speculation everywhere and I'll talk about that kind of at the end of the video. But that's like a really long trip that he made like pretty much right before he went missing. So once he got home, he did some pretty casual stuff. I think he went back uh, to working again or passing out flyers. He had a lot of flyers for the window washing company. So he would put those up and hand them out around town and stuff. And so on the 11th, the only really interesting thing that happened is that he came across two children who were locked out of their home and he tried to help them find a spare key, but they couldn't find one. So he ended up calling their mother for them. So everything worked out good. And then on the 12th, not, not a whole lot is known about what he did during the daytime on the 12th, but he was seen at his home from 10 to 10.30 p.m. by his neighbors, and he left at 10.30. He was only home for about 30 minutes, and then he just took off again. And so that's where his last trip begins. So December 13th, we're going to run down this, 7.52 a.m., one of Stephen's friends from the church calls Stephen 
and he wants to know if he can cover a meeting at church that he's supposed to be at. Not Stephen, the guy who calls. He's supposed to be at this meeting, but he can't go, so he calls Stephen. And Stephen said, you know, man, I can't go. I'm in Las Vegas. Yeah, Stephen casually drives to Las Vegas <laughs> at 1030 at night. What the heck? So he's like, yeah, I'm in Las Vegas. I can't. And the guy who called from the church, he's like, oh, I'm in Vegas too. Huh. Well, it's okay. You don't have to go back because I'm already on my way home anyway. I just didn't think I would make it. And neither of them told each other why they were in Vegas, which is so crazy to me because I am so nosy. If I call somebody, I'm like, hey, can you do this? And they're like, no, I'm in Vegas. And I'm like, what? I'm in Vegas too. I'm not just going to be like, cool, and hang up. I'm going to be like, oh, what are you doing in Vegas? Apparently, they don't do that. I don't know. Maybe it's just my family that's very extremely nosy. But that just seems crazy to me. Anyway, so then at 9.53, another friend from the church calls and he wants him to like officiate a service and give the announcements and all of that stuff. Well, he's like, again, he's like, I can't, I'm in Vegas. And that's pretty much the extent of that conversation. And then at 11.54 a.m., we only know this because of like security cameras in this area, Stephen parks his car at the dead end cul-de-sac of Savannah Springs Avenue which is odd because for one thing, nobody even knows what he's doing in Vegas. He doesn't really have any business in Vegas. He doesn't know anyone in Vegas. As far as the family and friends and the public knows, we don't know. So anyway, this is a retirement community. Like this is just old folks. And he drives his car in there and he parks in the only dead end cul-de-sac, the only area that is not in front of a house and this is the only area like that for miles like all these neighborhoods there's no dead ends no spot that's not in front of a house so like how would he have known about that if he hadn't been here before i feel like there's somebody over there that he knew that we're just not getting the story on we're just not getting the information because there's no way that he would just happen upon the one dead end spot that's not in front of a house that just doesn't happen i don't see that happening so at 12 p.m on the dot like it's literally on the dot he walks east on savannah springs and crosses to walk north on evening light street which we know because it was caught on security cameras of people who live in this neighborhood everybody in the neighborhood kind of has security cameras to make sure nothing happens i mean it's a retirement community what's gonna happen that's what you think but then this happens so he's seen walking down the street like i'm <laughs> he's walking with a purpose he doesn't look like he's drugged or drunk or meandering he's just walking like a normal person would if they're going somewhere and to me, the fact that it was 12 p.m. on the dot kind of seems like he had an appointment with somebody. So I feel like he knew somebody over there and he was supposed to meet them at exactly 12 or 12.15 or something like that. So that's just how it seems on my end. That's, that's what I'm thinking. This is also the last, like the last footage, the last time anybody has seen Steven is on that security camera when he's walking at 12 o'clock. But then the very next day at 6.04 in the morning, his phone pings a tower because he checked the voicemail on it or somebody checked the voicemail on it at 6.04 and it hasn't been used since then as far as we know. Um, and it pinged near Las Vegas, so that's not surprising, we knew that. But then on the 15th, someone discovered the car his abandoned car and they were trying to get in contact with whoever the owner was because i mean that's just what you would do wouldn't you if it was in your community and you didn't know whose car it was so he was looking in the car and he saw the flyers that stephen would usually pass out so he saw that there was a big phone number on the bottom and he called it and he reached stephen's boss the guy who was in charge of the window washing service and the boss gave the guy Stephen's cell phone number. And so he called and he called, but the phone was off. And he did not get a response at all. 
So Stephen's boss thought that something must be going on, so he called Stephen's mom a day later, or a couple of days later. On the 17th, Stephen's mom reports him missing, and I'll just give you a rundown of the stuff that they found. Um, so they searched from the 18th to the 24th in his home and his car and stuff like that. After that, they did a ton of other searches, like a ton of other searches. But initially, they searched the car. Inside his car, advertising flyers, miscellaneous receipts, snack food, Christmas presents, shaving kit, coats, pillows, blankets. So it's believed that he slept in his car when he drove down there because he left so late at night. Um, so that's why they think the pillows and stuff were in there. Um, and in his apartment, they found his guitar, notebook, computer, cell phone charger, recently purchased groceries, um, including bread, peanut butter, unsent job applications. And that, to me, doesn't sound like somebody who's about to run off or leave or kill themselves. Like, why would you do that? Why would you buy all that stuff? And, um, unaccounted for his cell phone keys, wallet, and driver's license. They later found his passport, so that's no longer unaccounted for. It's, they don't believe that he ran away somewhere. So that's what they found there. After that, things kind of just go cold, unfortunately. So once the police started doing their really big searches, they put out a bulletin type thing that they were considering this kind of a suicide type thing, which his family thought was completely crazy. They don't believe that he would do that, but that's how the police classified it. They had, you know, canines, helicopters, uh, over 70 volunteers, they said, and they were just combing the area. Never found anybody, nothing. Just gone without a trace. One of the main theories that I've seen is that Stephen was involved in some sort of illicit activity. A lot of people think it may be prescription drug fraud, um, other kinds of illegal drugs, stuff like that, which I can see where they're coming from because he's making these long trips. He's not telling anybody. He's like, you know, if you look at it, you think he's just wasting his time, wasting his gas, wasting his money. So you're like, what is he doing? But it would make sense if he was doing like drug runs, stuff like that, if he was working with somebody. Because that would explain the 12 o'clock on the dot. It would explain how he knew, you know, exactly where to park, where to go. It looked like he knew what he was doing. It didn't look like he was confused or looking for something. Like he wasn't, he wasn't unfamiliar with his surroundings. He was pretty comfortable, it looked to me like. So... And when he was walking past that camera, he had something in his hand. So it kind of just makes you wonder, what was he doing? And after his uh, disappearance, I read somewhere that they pinged the cell phone off of a tower that was in a very sketchy part of town, like near some apartment buildings where there were known people who had uh, prescription drug fraud, illicit drugs, stuff like that. So it wouldn't surprise me if he got mixed up in some sort of odd job that he thought was going to be honest work and it turned into something he wasn't expecting and he didn't know how to get out of it. That could be something to consider, but I'm not really sure. I don't know. I wouldn't think that he would do this knowingly. Like I don't feel like he would get mixed up with the wrong people. Um, intentionally, I don't feel like he was that kind of person. I mean, he was a devout Mormon. He loved his family. It just doesn't seem likely to me, and I could just be naive for thinking that, but that just isn't what it seems like to me. And actually, the police kind of responded to this because they had canines, like sniffers, to get in the car, around the car, in his apartment and stuff. They never found any trace of drug illegal drugs prescription drugs they didn't find anything and so i guess that kind of puts that theory to rest but i feel like he was probably looking for work he might have come upon somebody who had a little odd job for him and it turned out to be something that he did not expect and did not want to be involved with that wouldn't surprise me 
However, I do want to make it absolutely clear that I do agree with the family and I do support them in their belief that he did not kill himself. I do not believe that he killed himself. I don't think that he would have done anything to harm himself. I, it just doesn't seem like that kind of case to me. I understand that he was probably depressed and wasn't having that great of a time in his life, but I don't think it was severe enough for him to want to take his own life. I, I don't really, that doesn't feel right to me. When I think about it, it just doesn't feel correct. So, I know I've been putting pictures up, but I'm gonna go ahead and give his description. Steven is five foot 10 or 11 inches tall. He has blonde hair and blue eyes. And if you know anything, saw anything, if you know anything about where Steven might be, what may have happened to him, even if you think you know something or you think you saw something, just let somebody know Contact St. George Police Department at 435-627-4319. That is 435-627-4319. Or you can contact the Henderson Police at 702-267-5000. That is 702-267-5000. And of course, I will have that stuff linked below. Um, sources linked below, more information below, and I will definitely have those numbers below as well because we want to try to make a difference and hopefully we can do something to bring Stephen home or bring, bring his family some closure. Thank you guys so, so much for joining me again today. Leave me a like if you like the video. Comment down below. Tell me what you think about the case. What are your theories? But please do remember to be respectful to the victim and the victim's family. Just don't say anything out of pocket. If you do, I will delete the comment because I don't want anything negative toward this man or his family. I just want positivity. If it's about me, you can say something negative. I don't really care. But just don't say anything about the victim or the victim's family, please. Um, also, let me know about those other video ideas. If you guys want to know, if you guys want to see videos like that, let me, down, let me know down below. And uh, feel free to subscribe because I make new videos every Monday and Friday unless my dog chews up my charger. Anyway, thank you guys again, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!